Clearly, it's fundamental to assess how severe we think a lesion is, to both decide if it's likely to be causing symptoms and also if it requires treatment. Assessment of lesion severity is often very subjective when evaluated by clinicians performing angiography. We often tend to eyeball the severity of the stenosis. This is usually reasonably accurate if the lesion is severe, as in the example shown, but tends to get more subjective as the stenosis becomes less severe in the mild to moderate range. Remember that on an angiogram, we are merely studying the lumen of the coronary artery. We are therefore only estimating the amount of disease in the coronary artery wall by how much it impinges on the lumen of the vessel. In this diagram, we can see the lumen is the same size in both vessels, despite one having 50% plaque burden and one having 20%. Angiography is in stark contrast to other modalities of imaging, such as cardiac CT, where it's possible to assess the proportional burden of disease within the vessel wall, in addition to the impact of this on the lumen. When we assess disease on an angiogram, remember also we are trying to assess the percentage stenosis in reference to the normal, undiseased vessel size. On this diagram, the diameter of the lumen, small r, should be expressed as a percentage of the reference vessel diameter where it appears normal, large r, rather than in the adjacent disease segment, x. This can be difficult if the vessel is diffusely diseased throughout. Despite all of these concerns, a luminogram can provide insight regarding the severity of a lesion. As noted, lesions are usually determined according to the degree to which they reduce the lumen of the coronary artery expressed as a percentage. 0% indicates no apparent stenosis and 100% a complete occlusion of the vessel. We normally consider less than 25% minimal stenosis, 25-49% to mild stenosis, 40 to 69% moderate stenosis, 70 to 99% severe stenosis, and 100% an occlusion. Be aware of plaque distribution, as this is not often uniform and can in some cases be very eccentric. This needs to be taken into account when determining percentage stenosis. Most lesions are not uniform in cross section. We don't have the luxury to look at them in cross section when performing an angiogram. When looking at them on an angiogram, lesions are always quantified by the most severe view of the stenosis. Lesions are often underestimated due to failing to view a vessel in more than one view or projection to fully assess this degree of stenosis, but are never overestimated. Top tip here is always take multiple orthogonal views when deciding on lesion severity. We also need to make an assessment of the length of the disease segment, and this can be difficult, especially if the vessel is tortuous. The direction from which the vessel is viewed can also impact on the lesion length assessment. A certain angiographic views will foreshorten certain segments of vessel as they essentially move away or towards the image intensifier. So choose the best view to assess the segment of disease you are interested in. My tip here is that a way of doing this in practice is to either use a section of angioplasty guide wire which is of a defined length, for instance the radio opaque section of a guide wire is normally about 30 millimeters in many wires, or use a deflated balloon of known length for reference. You may have heard people referring to a lesion suitable for a trainee as a type A lesion. It is very useful to understand the characteristics of a lesion as these often determine the chances of success and the risk of complications during PCI. Historically, people have used the ACC AHA classification to do this. A word of caution here is that type A lesions are not always straightforward. And if, for example, the coronary vessels perforate during PCI, nothing about this case is then straightforward. So never be lulled into a false sense of security. Type A lesions these are usually discrete and less than 10 millimeters in length. The disease tends to be smooth and in a non-angulated segment with little or no calcification, no major branches and no associated thrombus. The lesion is usually easily accessible. Type B lesions are usually between 10 and 20 millimeters in length, of moderate tortuosity 
and moderately angulated. This classification includes osteal disease and disease with major branches requiring two guide wires. It can include lesions with moderate calcification or thrombus. Type C lesions are often long, diffuse lesions more than two centimeters long, very tortuous, or with the inability to protect major side branches. Degenerate saphenous vein grafts and total chronic occlusions are included here. Most imaging manufacturers provide quantitative coronary analysis or QCA software to facilitate quantification of lesion severity. This uses a known reference size, usually a guiding catheter for instance, to calibrate the system and quantify the stenosis as a percentage of the reference vessel. It is dependent on accurate calibration and clear images. Branches, bends, overlapping vessels and poor opacification of the lumen can all make this technology prone to artifact. And because of this, I do not routinely use it in my own clinical practice. Intracoronary imaging is now easy to use and is therefore increasing in popularity. It is good for determining the true size of vessels and also in helping to avoid stenting into significant plaques. It has the benefit of being able to visualize and accurately measure the reference size of the vessel and not just assess the lumen. It can also look at plaque characteristics such as calcification. It does require instrumentation of the vessel and as such is usually not routinely used in diagnostic coronary angiography alone or by non-PCI trained operators. When performing a PCI, where the vessel is going to be instrumented anyway, it can be a useful tool, although it does add time to the procedure and obviously has cost implications. To reiterate again, as it's so important, intravascular imaging can be very helpful in assessing the vessel for size, lesion length, landing zones, and to prevent stent deployment into heavy plaque. In addition, it is excellent in assessing the stent post-PCI to confirm adequate expansion and apposition to the vessel wall and to exclude complications such as distal edge dissections following stenting, especially if the angiogram is not clear. Sometimes lesions appear moderate, but can be in important positions within the coronary artery. For example, the left main stem, proximal LAD, or other large caliber dominant vessels. It may be difficult, even with good angiographic views, to come to a decision as to whether the lesion is potentially causing ischemia or the patient's symptoms. Remember, an angiogram is an anatomical test. The assumption that a severe angiographic appearance will be functionally significant and cause myocardial ischemia is not always true. A pressure wire study adds a functional component to cath lab assessment. It is especially good for moderate or ambiguous lesions and will be discussed in a dedicated separate lesson in more detail, but it is noted here as being an important tool in overall lesion severity assessment. Remember the limitations of angiography, which is just a luminogram. Use it to assess for percentage stenosis, lesion length, and other characteristics, but if unsure, consider adding information from an additional in-lab modality, either by intracoronary imaging or functional assessment. Remember, you can never have too much information. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.